alternative and other ecological perspectives on long-term care. How many of you are born in Toronto? <laughs> How many people from Winnipeg? <laughs> By default. By default? Saskatchewan? Anybody here from Saskatchewan? Montreal. 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 Again, again, while we're waiting, I, I, I apologize to some of you looking at Gerda and maybe some others if you've seen some of what um, I've presented at various meetings, but I assure you none of these slides have been put together the way they are today. Yes. Okay. So. Um, I think what we can do is just um, perhaps begin a, in a sense. I'll do a little preliminary intro, and if she walks in while I'm doing it, then we're ready okay. to go. Yeah, why don't we just go ahead with the introduction, then when she comes yes. in, that's fine. I'd just so, like to yeah. say welcome to everyone, and thank you so much for coming to the Institute for Life Course and Aging today to hear our evening seminar. Um, our director, Dr. Lynn McDonald, from the Faculty of Social Work, is en route. Uh, she going to be coming through the door any second, and she would, had said she would like to do the introduction, so I'm just doing a little prelim here. Um, just for those of you who don't know, uh, we also have workshops going on this year. It's the first time we've been offering them, and at the moment we have an aging and mental health workshop going online. It's in its second week. Uh, if you're interested, because it's online, we thought we would let uh, people join late. So um, that's a possibility at this point in time. Uh, there are two <laughs> so uh, we also, and there she is. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. yeah, go go ahead and sit oh, there because no. Lynn probably is going to have to have one of the other seats. Hi, Lynn. Because I'm all nervous. <laughs> no, go, go ahead and move over. Go ahead and move oh, over. Oh, yeah. Move right and over. And you can and go around. Uh, okay, well, so I was going to introduce you, but yes, you are. I just want to say I've known Michael. And you can, you can use that if you No, no, I've known that. Michael Rackless when we were baby gerontologists yes, <laughs> at uh, Deer Lodge Hospital back in Winnipeg. We're both from Winnipeg and we both ended up in day hospital together. And were you an intern then? I finally got out a couple of years later actually. Okay. No, I, I, was, I was actually a second year we, medical student. Wow. I finished it was between second and third year medicine. Wow. Well, there, there we were, both of us. I was a social worker and he was a doctor and we actually talked to each other. It was great. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> I just want to say that Michael Rockless is a wonderful voice who speaks for older people and for health care for all Canadians and I think we're very lucky to have him here today. He's been on commissions, two commissions that I'm aware of. He has written extensively about what's wrong with our health care system. So please welcome Thank you. Um, and, um, and and I should I should say that um, that I also have a part time faculty appointment here because as I say anybody can teach at U of T if they do it for free. I'm a associate professor in the Delano School of Public Health, um, and where I mainly focus on teaching community medicine residents. So here and and, and uh, I would like to start off by saying that 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 Lynn, you were not the the first influential social worker in my life. Of course, my mother. Um, as a professor of social work at the University of Manitoba, um, was the social worker of the year in Manitoba in 2008, um, and was sort of an honorific for there. And, uh, um, and, and as a social worker then working at the Children's Hospital in Winnipeg while I was in medical school, she would remind me on a daily basis that she drew, drove me back to uh, boarding school. That, uh, that in, in, in fact, what, you know, uh, so the, 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 the values that, that I have are very much um, recycled ones from my parents. And, and I'd also like to take the opportunity in this room to just um, uh, also mention and uh, um, in memoriam um, um, uh, Evelyn Shapiro, many of you will know. Um, uh, and what people may not know is that, that I did an elective with Evelyn in medical school for four months and uh, um, where um, we researched um, the uh, folks who were on the waiting list for nursing homes at that point and looked at the capacity of home care to influence their choices in care. It was a it was wonderful experience and introduced me to to Evelyn and, and research and all sorts of other things. And it was a fantastic community in Winnipeg at that time um, with some terrific people. 
Okay, so so here's, I'm going to talk very quickly. Some of you know I talk quickly. I'm assuming this is the University of Toronto. This is, uh, for those of you who can see the slides, I apologize if, if those of you who can't, maybe we can get another chair in the back or something. Um, but but um, that I'm going to talk very quickly. Um, I've got a lot of slides. I'm, uh, I'd really like not to be stopped unless you don't understand what the x-axis is or something like that. And then um, I, I think that we'll still have, this runs to 1.30, I'm told, mm -hmm. that, that we'll still have at least 20 minutes, hopefully, half an hour for discussion. So starting off, as you've been reading through this slide, um, I've been using this slide since 1987. Um, and, and it's become more relevant every year. Um, and and, and it, is, it is to start us off that, that you know, we've really known what we should have been doing for a long time. Many of you will remember those golden days of health policy in the 1980s. Um, that, that when Larry Grossman was, was health minister. How many of you would give your right arm to have Larry Grossman as the health minister right now? Um, and, uh, and, and, and then the, the commissions and the Peterson government and all that neat thing, thing you know, the promise that might have been there. And so in the meantime, we continue to have problems with primary health care. I'm not to say that we haven't achieved some things in these areas, but we continue to have problems with primary health care, integrating coordinating services, achieving a community focus for health and emphasizing um, health promotion and disease prevention. So here's the outline. The con what's the context? And I'm going to talk about the context, particularly the Medicare debate, because this, this discussion about our aging population and health care is very much a key part of the Medicare debate. Um, the elderly will not undermine Medicare sustainability if we change the way we deliver services. And Community support services, primary health care, and public health are the foundations of an efficient health care system. Why is it taking so long to establish this, and how can we hasten it? And I'm going to run through the first three points like really quickly, because I'm assuming that most of you know a lot of this information, if not most of it, and probably agree with my, most of my values. So then you can tell me I've misread you later on. So here's the context. There are assertions that Medicare is not sustainable. Um, you know, we've got everybody from, um, you know, the senator from Extended Care, Mr. Kirby, to, um, to Brian Mulroney, another um, real uh, paragon of virtue in the Canadian uh, health policy and policy scene, who are telling us that Medicare is sustainable. And Dr. David Dodge, who despite spending uh, almost a year at UBC working with people like Bob Evans, seems to have not understood um, the basics of health economics. Um, and so you have people like that who are regularly, you know, and that doesn't include Michael Bliss, and you name it, right? Um, in fact, wouldn't it be easy to give one of their speeches? You know, <laughs> Medicare is not sustainable, yeah. costs are out of control, the aging of the population is really going to put a fork in it, and so just do what you always should have done, go private. Okay, 10 seconds, that's all. It takes me like an hour, 100 slides, to go to rebut it, right? But, so there's, there's all this stuff out there, but it, you know, when you strip down the Medicare debate, as Bob Evans would say, it isn't a technical one. It's almost always one about values, and it's the same debate we've been having for years with the resurgence of the values on the right side of the political spectrum that are make, giving louder megaphones to, to the views that, uh, that we've heard for 50 and 50 years that Medicare will never be sustainable, not sustainable now, et cetera. There are assertions that as stable now, aging is going to bankrupt us, and we're coming out of this slow, ec serious economic downturn, and as a number of commentators here and, and some of the board or other places have noted, that it's really surprising, as opposed to the 1930s, when this was like, you know, mea culpa from um, uh, the forces, you know, of, of uh, unrestrained capitalism, um, that in this recession, even though it appears that it was due to greed and financial deregulation, um, um, and going hand in hand, that that the that aside from the first six months of the crisis, when you got views that we need to reassert Keynesian economic policy, it's actually been sort of a, a reassertion of the right, you know. And and we don't have good effective financial regulation in the U.S. We're we're at risk of all sorts of serious problems. We've got pot money from um, cheap interest rate countries going off to places, you know, like in, the, in, in Brazil and China, other places. So we've got this still really terrible situation, but we, we, we don't seem to have learned much from it. Um, and here, this is an interesting quote from uh, Churchill, um, rereading the, or re the, reading the, his history of the Second World War. Um, and uh, this beautiful quote where he talks about the threat of invasion by Germany. Um, in 1940 and, and early 41, 
And in fact, um, anybody who really knew anything knew it was extremely unlikely the Germans would ever invade Britain. And yet everybody was terrified that this was imminent. Um, and Churchill was prudent enough to make preparations, but you didn't really need a whole lot of preparation of crossing the channel, particularly any time after September was you know, never going to happen. The, the Allies barely got on you know, the beaches in D-Day um, with you know, 10 times as many men and material as the Germans might have had. So, so certainly no, those who knew the most were least scared, and I hope that applies to you folks about the, most of these issues. So here's the sustainability of Medicare. Health um, slowly increased its share of our economy for eight years after it sort of fell from 92 to 2000 as a share of our GDP, and I'll show you the graphs shortly. Health, care, health share of GDP rose dramatically in 2009 because the economy collapsed. It's a ratio, right? In 2010, costs were controlled, and the economy began to grow again, and health decreased its share of GDP. Um, and in fact, this will almost certainly, um, unless we get a, you really go into a serious double dip recession, unless there's way bigger, you know, wage and salary increases than we can anticipate in healthcare, because it looks like the line is being held fairly tight. Then, and with the economy growing at least at two and a half percent per year for the next years, we're going to see health as a share of GDP continue to decline. So, and, and if we fo focus particularly on public health care spending, it's just slightly higher than its previous peak in 1992, which was another sort of depth of recession year. So here's, here's what this, the, the numbers look like. This is, this is including the most recent high high numbers from November. Um, and um, the total health care spending is a share of GDP, the public in blue, and then private in red. And what I've done is I've got <coughs> dashed lines which indicate what the lines would have looked like if the economy had grown in 2008 or 2009 and 10 at the same rate as 2000, 2008. Now you might say that's unrealistic assumption, and it is a little bit because those were good years. But just to give you an idea, um, you know, we wouldn't have seen much of a crisis if there is one, particularly if you look at the blue line. Um, and and what's and, and as you can see, if we just look at the raw numbers, it did spike up by one percent of GDP in that year. That was totally due to the collapse of the economy. And now it's coming down again, and will likely continue to decline as um, again the economy improves. And we're going to see, just as we saw in the '90s, um, some pretty serious controls on public sector expenditures, in particular. This is the Ontario results. It looks about the same, but what is interesting is that when, particularly when you look at the total spending, is that this reflects the decline, long-term decline in the Ontario manufacturing sector and the movement of Ontario over the last couple of decades from a have to a official have-not province. And if you look at what's happened to the economies of Saskatchewan and Alberta and Newfoundland the last three or four years, it's dramatic. Saskatchewan's economy um, grew by over 20% in like the 2008 um, with the rise in potash and oil and other things. So this is, if we look at the aggregate data across the country, here is the provincial health care spending. Public spending, spending is about 70% of total spending. Um, the provincial health care spending um, eliminates workers' compensation, municipal expenditures, and it looks more directly at the statistic that people talk about in the debate, which is that you know Ontario public health care spending is not is not um, sustainable, so it's about 95 percent, maybe 92 percent of the public spending. Now, so healthcare has slightly increased its share of provincial program spending. Let's look at this issue because we hear you know Jeffrey Simpson tells us every week. Sometimes you're reading like like you know Marcus G's column, you know somebody who I now got bigger eyes for it since Mr. Ford is the mayor. And I actually had an email exchange with him. He just sort of threw in gratuitously, you know, and healthcare costs are out of control. It's sort of like, you know, you're reading a recipe, right? And, and you know, by the way, healthcare costs are out of control. It's just everywhere. It's one of those things that everyone knows. So it slightly increased its share of program spending since late 1990s. But this is mainly due to cuts in other areas rather than increases in health spending itself. So the share of government program spending going to healthcare has been stable for seven years. Program spending is government budgets minus their interest payments. So it's attempting to strip out 
um, what is uh, what what are our um, capital expenditures from ongoing expenditures? So here's the Canadian provincial healthcare spending and Ontario spending as a percent of overall program spending. So when you hear that healthcare spending is like you know it used to be a third, now it's a half, and before you know it, um, you know well the Ontario budget paper said. Um, that by 2022 it was going to be 70 percent of program spending. The TD report, I mean, I thought they, you know, they've got like there's all these economists and everything. You know, they said that it was going to be 80 percent of program spending by 2030. Um, now, um, I want you to just imagine, because you people are smart people, some of you know math and everything, um, how do you take this red line especially, but even the blue line, how do you take that line and jump it up to 70% in 12 years? How do you do that? I mean, and it's, in, you know, if you look at the TD report, you actually see the same data I've got, you know, straight line for seven years, and then it just goes blip, and, you know, like, they, there's no good rationale I can see, but, you know, they managed to actually get op-eds the same day on the Toronto Star and the National Post about this stuff. So, so yeah, um, that, that particularly if we look at the, that we've got this plateau right through most of the 80s and the 90s, then it jumps up here and then we seem to be at a new plateau. And as I indicated, you know, we're getting the clamps on spending, the economy is growing, revenues are starting to come back, so that line is not going up, right? So um, that overall government program spending as a share of GDP has fallen sharply. This is something we don't talk about. The only place I see this is the National Post, which I read every day but I have to hide from my wife so she doesn't, <laughs> not reminded that I actually pay for a subscription to it. Um, but, but that's the only place I read this. Um, and, and, and taxes have been cut by 5.3% of GDP since 2000. That's the equivalent of $85 billion. Now I know you can't get much for a billion these days, but you know, <laughs> even if we just saved half that money, um, you know, we're talking about universal childcare program at least as good as and, and uh, public uh, as coverage as in Quebec, and we're talking about you know, first dollar pharmacare, first dollar home care. And we could even buy some jets if we really need them. <laughs> um, so, so, so that's a huge amount of money, right? Um, and government outlays used to be a much higher share of GDP in the U.S., but now they're nearly the same. You know, you know uh, that when you, we went to school and we were told, you know, Canada's got a bigger role for government, we couldn't have a CPR without government sort of subsidizing it and all this kind of stuff. Well, that's changing. Um, so here's Canadian government outlays. Government outlays are government budgets minus um, any debt, minus any surplus and plus any deficit. And, um, and this, unfortunately, these data are, are now about a year behind. Um, and so that blip up, we don't see the blip down yet. But it shows you the general trend that Canadian government outlays um, used, was, was sort of mid-40s, high-40s for uh, most of the post, uh, most of the period after sort of the late 60s. Um, and then we get into the early, uh, the late 80s, early 90s, and then the economy collapses, and then we get into these big deficits, and then we've had this relentless cut of the public sector, um, which started um, under Cretchen, of course, on the Martin budgets, and, and have continued. Um, if anything, you know, the, the Tories have stabilized um, government spending there. But um, then if we, again, compare the U.S., this is really striking, because the Canadian government sector has always been bigger than the American government sector. Um, since figures have been kept, you know, that could be comparable for like 60, 70 years. And as you can see in the early 90s, we were like 30, 35% bigger government sector relatively than in the U.S. And now we're just about the same. So um, that, that depending on what happens in the next few years, but likely with you know with the economy coming back here and um, and with um, I think they're not going to find it that easy to cut spending in the US um, even though they've cut taxes so you know we're, we've got about the same size public sector but as you know Bob Ray said years ago Canadians uh, want to have a European levels of public service but pay American levels of taxes well we've got one part of that now we are at American level of taxation um, and you know it's all it's very misleading when you Americans will say you're very heavily taxed that's because the highest marginal rate for our income tax is still higher because we've got a more progressive system but if you look at all taxes 
you know, the take in the U.S. is as big as in Canada. Um, so, and our healthcare costs are similar to other wealthy countries, and of course, substantially less than the U.S. Um, that 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 again, you know, maybe it's not. Some of you probably used to use this defense as well when you were young. You know, but mom, all the other kids were doing it. So maybe that's not the best defense of bad behavior. But on the other hand, you know, it's com somewhat comforting to, that we're there in the middle of the pack. The U.S. is spending way more than anybody else, of course, very inefficiently and inequitably. And then here we are with countries that we like to think we have comparable standards of living to. You know, whether you know France, uh, Germany, um, the Netherlands, Denmark. You know, so Sweden. So those. Are, so so between Sweden and then France, that's one percent below and one percent above what we're spending. That's sort of like the kind of countries that most Canadians would say, "Oh yeah, I could live there if I could speak the language." Um, the el so the elderly will not undermine Medicare sustainability if we change the delivery system. Let's get into this. Myth now that it is true that Canada is aging and healthcare costs increase with age. Aging is responsible, however, for only moderate cost increases overall. The elderly are healthier than ever. This should be good news because, actually, of course, it's not expensive um, to it, healthy people are not expensive. It's it's uh, getting older is not necessarily expensive. It's 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 developing sickness and particularly disability that is expensive. <coughs> So um, if we're healthier than ever, that would be a good thing. But of course, as I'll indicate, as many of you will know, we really don't have the great data in this country to say one way or the other. Increase in costs are due to increases in utilization, much of which is quite dubious. You know, do we, you know, my father, um, for reasons that were, complete, were, were, were mysterious, had a CAT scan of his chest done a few years ago. Um, and there was some little thing there. It might have been um, a gone complex, might have been old TB. We didn't know. It probably wasn't anything. He felt fine. He's had asthma for years, hasn't smoked in like 40 years. And so, um, it, but they said to be on the safe side, we'll do another one in six months. So they did another one in six months. And it wasn't there anymore. Maybe it was never there. Maybe it was a button. I mean, I don't know. <laughs> And so then they said, well, but we better do another one in another six months. In the meantime, you know, he's getting like as much, you know, as many X, uh, radiation as like three or four hundred chest x-rays. And he's not asking for this. In fact, it's a real inconvenience, you know, to go into his aquacide classes and doing other things he likes to do to, to take time to see the doctor. So, um, and then we've got high perform examples of high performing health systems that can control costs while enhancing quality. So this is, these are some slides I pinched from uh, Daka Byron Spencer from McMaster, um, just sh showing you what you all know, which is the percentage of Canada 65 and older is forecast to rise substantially over the next 20 years. And also what you likely know, which is that healthcare expenditures by age are, are higher for, the, for older populations. And so people put this all together and say, of course, this is going to bankrupt us. But on the other hand, if you strip out, even if you just look at, at what will happen with aging, Bob Evans and his crew at UBC have been doing these calculations for 25 years, and it's like nobody reads these academic papers particularly, right? So, so this is from some work that Hugh McKenzie, many of you know, an, an economist in Toronto, and I did for the Canadian Federation of Nurses Unions last summer on the sustainability of, of Medicare, and I even have a couple of uh, uh, of the booklets, um, if, if, if you wish them. Um, and so, so he redid the same kinds of analysis Bob has been doing, and, um, and then did it by province, which is kind of neat, and showing that over the previous 10 years, it's been less than 0.8% per year additional <coughs> healthcare costs due to <coughs> aging alone. Substantial differences, however, between the provinces, of course. And then if we look into the future, and by and large, it is, the, it is the prairies that are going to do better because they've got a younger population. Um, a lot of that has to do with the fact they've got higher aboriginal um, as a percentage of their population. Um, but uh, even looking at the national situation over the next 25 years, it's going to be adding 1% to healthcare costs per year. Given that population increase is also adding 1%, but that, again, economic growth has been two and a half percent on average for the last 40 years, um, these should be affordable. Um, and the elderly are likely healthier than ever. The elderly are definitely in Canada living longer than ever. Unfortunately, we really don't have good accurate data over time on the Canadian prevalence of elderly disability. We just, we just don't. And you folks will 
likely many of you will know the databases, etc., better than I. Um, but I did check this out when I was doing my preparation for some briefings for the Canadian Health Services Research Foundation with Russell Wilkins and other folks, and, and it does seem that almost everybody talked to agrees, yeah, we just gradually we don't have the right data. Um, now, on the other hand, this is sort of like when I was going to school. So we've got a situation where we've got pretty good American data, um, and we did have really poor Canadian data. So who, where do we extrapolate from? Poor Canadian data or the you know fairly good American data? But if we look at the American data, it is seem to be supporting the Jim Freeze's theory of 30 years ago, the compression of morbidity, you know, the idea that if we all live healthier, and we are living healthier, um, then in fact we're likely to not only live longer, but have all the illness and disability pile up just at the end. So, you know, we walk off the tennis court, and then, you know, we have one glass too many of wine, and it tips our livers, and then our kidneys, and our heart, and everything goes wrong, and 12 hours later we're dead. So that's, that's the thought, that, and, and if you, it originally, and again, I dabble in a bunch of areas, I like to say, you know, my knowledge base is a mile wide, but in some places only a few inches deep, but in a few places, places it's, you know, several meters deep. And so I've been following this debate um, since about 1990 or even earlier when I went to a conference where Ken Manton and a bunch of other people spoke, and at that time, they were saying Freeze's hypothesis was full of it. It wasn't correct. So, and Ken Manton is some of you really a, a major demographer in the U.S. I think he's at um, UNC, um, and um, and 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 he he has become a convert over time to freeze studying mainly data from the Americans with Disability surveys and other surveys. So this is unfortunate. There's another article due any day, you know, on the 2009 data. I expect it, you know, any time in the next few months we'll get even more data. But we've got data since 84, which is showing that there's been a, be, there's been a, a, a rise in the proportion of people over 65 with no disability, and that the people with severe disability who we're really concerned about, because those are the folks that cost the most money from a policy perspective, has actually fallen by 30% in relative terms um, over 10 years now, so, or over 20 years. So this is, this is looking good. Um, and also, there was a neat article um, in Science in September um, looking at different ways of thinking about disability and the elderly, um, looking at, because traditionally we looked at the old age dependency ratios, and this is what, you know, um, um, when the, taking the Python and all the other apocalyptic stories about the elderly, that's what they're using. So they're using the people over 65 divided by the people, you know, roughly 20 to 65. So old people all assume to be non-productive, non-contributing to the, 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 the real or informal economies, um, and, um, and to, you know, li literally on the backs of people who are working. But that's a really primitive way of looking at things. So, and particularly because, again, it's not just aging per se, it's, 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 it's sickness, illness, and getting to death that's important. So this statistic looks at um, it looks at the, the proportion of the population within 15 years of death, actuarially. So, you know, 20 years ago, that would have been people in their early 60s. Now, that's people in their late 60s, early 70s, right? So, so if you divide that group up over the people who are younger than that, then the, it doesn't look so apocalyptic anymore, going over 40 years um, rising uh, that statistic by just 50%. But again, that doesn't really totally encapsulate things. What we really are most interested in is the um, disability um, group, particularly those with severe disabilities in the elderly. And if we look at, at all adults, like over 20, who are disabled over the population 20 to 65, then we see that there really aren't big changes at all. Now, this uses um, U.S. data, and it uses data from, I think, 11 European countries, and we're a mystery, the frozen white north here, that we, we don't know what, uh, what really is going on in our population. But, you know, I don't, I'd, be, I'd be shocked if it were dramatically different um, than the U.S. and Europe. And again, using U.S. data, um, um, up until about 10, 20 years ago, 
Um, life expectancy at 65 was actually greater in the U.S. than in Canada, but that has changed. And so I would anticipate with those trends um, and with other trends, um, lower rates of obesity, amongst other things, I mean, that, that the U.S. trends should be reasonably applicable to Canada. They should be reasonably applicable to Canada. Okay. So, and the big thing is, as I said earlier, it's increased utilization that's causing increased health care costs. It's like all of us are using more health care all the time. And what is quite interesting is this is a very busy slide. Again, this is from Byron Spencer's work. And the data are now, I guess, about a year old. I haven't remade this slide. But if you look at the, um, the, the, what's been happening to age-specific utilization rates. Now, remember, I showed you a slide where the actual absolute utilization rates are much higher for older people than younger people. But if you look at what's happened in relative terms to these age-adjusted rates, they've actually overall, that's the total is in blue, the relative increase is less for the elderly than it is for younger people. And one of the interesting things, uh, just you know, parenthetically, not for the young people, not for the elderly, but the use of institutions by young people has really skyrocketed, which is probably has something to do with um, the success of neonatal intensive care, which unfortunately also leads to many uh, people, many younger people and then adults with severe disabilities. Um, but but the rise in the elderly in utilization is that that striking is for drugs. It's not for other kinds of services, drugs and physician services. But it's not for institutions. Look at look at this, the rise in the use of of, inst of, of other institutions, mainly long term care, is actually much less for the elderly than it has been. Although they are the greatest, you know, absolute consumers. So I hope that slide is too busy, but it gets across the point that all of us, particularly younger people, are using more health care all the time. There, so there, now, some people would say there are unmet needs, but there are, there's considerable evidence of waste. Yes, we do have unmet needs, particularly in areas like community-based care, particularly at this time of year, it seems. But there's lots of evidence of waste. Um, we don't manage diabetes well. We don't do the modern things we should do to improve access. And our, of course, our prescribing of drugs is just abysmal. So we've got a quality problem in our health system. All of you, like, almost all of you likely know that. Um, walk out of here and go onto the street and talk to the average person. And unless you're deliberative in your dialogue with them, they'll say, what do you mean quality is an issue? But ask them for their stories, and they'll hear, oh, yeah, my mother did get the wrong drug. And, then she got a rash, and they said it might have been due to that. She had to stay in hospital an extra couple of days, or you know, whatever. So, so that 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 there there are, um, if you're deliberative in your dialogue, people realize yes, the quality isn't so good. Particularly once you say to them, "Did you know that in a properly organized system with just the number of doctors and nurses that we've got, you should expect to see your family doctor, somebody working with your family doctor within 24 hours, get elective specialty um, appointments within five business days, and get your elective surgery within two months." Then people might start saying, wow, I didn't know that. Now I'm not so happy with the service I'm getting. So, but it, it's rife with quality problems. Um, Canada, um, the Baker Norton study from 2004 showed, um, replicated um, studies that have been done in seven other countries, indicating that 5 to 10% of all deaths in developed countries um, are preventable deaths that occur in hospitals, which is pretty striking, isn't that? That's pretty amazing. Um, um, and then if you extend that, to you know, uh, to other errors of, of commission and omission, um, which would include things like um, only maybe half of diabetics in Canada getting proper follow-up and that kind of stuff. This starts to be you know a major cause of death, either the over you know negligence uh, as it were that leads to death, um, or um, systematic negligence. I'm not blaming any individuals here, but systematic negligence, um, or just not doing the right things at the right time. So. And there's serious problems with the overall quality, as you all know, with long-term care and primary health care. Again, um, not not in any way due to any individuals. Certainly not. You know, no health care provider gets up and says, "I'm really looking forward to producing some bad quality care." But um, but they're stuck stuck in structures that we'll talk about shortly that make it difficult to deliver quality care. And although again, this has got very little penetration outside of healthcare. Although I find it easier. 
to get people outside of healthcare to understand this than inside of healthcare. Because in, we always think in healthcare that, of course, you know, better quality is going to cost a lot of money. Whereas, you know, why? You know, why should that be the case? Um, there's lots of examples in, in other sectors where that's not the case. And there's lots of examples in healthcare where doing the right thing at the right time will, in fact, lead to lower costs overall. Here's just a couple of examples. Um, you know, I've been trying to embarrass people uh, in Canada for about a decade on that Sault Ste. Marie is the only place in Canada I know where virtually everyone with congestive heart failure has a nurse coordinating their care when they go home. As a result, it's pretty unusual to have somebody with congestive heart failure go through their emergency department. Whereas in, you know, other parts of Canada, it, it is the most common reason why Canadians are admitted to hospital, okay, except for women delivering babies. Um, and um, and it, it, there's, there's about 40 randomized controlled trials showing that nurse coordination of care out of hospital will reduce readmissions by, on average, 50%. Um, and there's like eight economic studies. The last time I reviewed this 30 years ago, this literature. Um, and one from Alberta showed um, that there would be um, $2,500 in overall net cost savings for every person who got this better care. Um, that's staggering, isn't it? And there's lots of evidence, you know, COPD and other, in Ottawa, a study a few years ago showed one out of six of all patients over 65 were readmitted to a hospital within 30 days. You know, this is just, you know, like, how can you discharge somebody over 65 from hospital? You just spent like $10,000 on them, right? And you're not gonna have a nurse look at their home before they go home. You're not, you know, everything's fine at home, I'm just fine, right? You know except there are the 20 cats that haven't been fed in a week and, you know, two years of newspapers. Um, you know, that, 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 how can we spend all this money on a hospital, on hospital care, and then not have a nurse coordinating care when the patient goes home, not know what the home looks like, not talk to the family, right? So, uh, and, and, and then um, just, you know, we're just wasting money hand over fist on drugs, so now we're gonna, the generic manufacturers will get less than drugs, stores will get less and all that's probably a good thing. But in the meantime, um, in 2003, when we were telling people in Ontario we couldn't provide home care to our parents and our grandparents, um, that Ontario was spending $65 million a year through the ODB on Vioxx. And, and because we made it so easy to get compared to BC, um, that, that uh, there were um, <coughs> hundreds of people in Ontario who died prematurely. So, and, and it's not the aging of our population, as Bill Delsey would say, that threatens to precipitate a financial crisis. A failure to examine, make appropriate changes to our healthcare system. So, here's an example. You, again, many of you will be familiar with this work from Marcus Hollander um, in Victoria, a natural experiment where um, in some regions um, of BC in the 1990s, so-called social or preventive home care was cut. In other regions, it was not cut. They, they, it, this natural experiment enabled the um, participants to be followed up, and after the third year of, um, in areas that with cuts, per capita expenditures were now 50% greater when they had only been roughly 10% greater um, at the beginning. So community support services, primary health care and public health are the foundations of an efficient health care system. And here's another example um, from um, Nancy Hall, some of you may know, and an ex-Winnipegger. Ex um, uh, a health promotion intervention for BC Frail Seniors, a wonderful experiment where um, seniors who were um, um, entering long-term care were randomly assigned to either receive um, traditional care or to receive enhanced care. So they're entering the continuing care system which covers home care and institutional care. And the experimental group got six visits on average from a public health nurse, basically linking them up with community services, making sure their primary health care was adequate, talking about their diet, exercise, blah, 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 blah. And then over the course of, um, of three years of follow-up, um, the, uh, the experimental group is roughly 40% less likely to end up in uh, long-term care or die. So, you know, if a drug company, I, I thought this would be a great opportunity. We call the intervention a drug, <laughs> but actually, it's just, a, it's just a sugar pill, but that's how we get the funding, because you can't get the funding for this unless it is a drug. And if it were a drug, I mean, this is how it would be sold, right? Um, that uh, reduce your risk of dying or ending up in a nursing home. How much would you pay for this drug, right? Well, then, uh, apparently, most health systems won't pay anything. And 
but looking further at, at examples of some innovation that we need to think of for care, the elderly comprehensive community care, the so-called PACE program that um, I asked some of you about earlier, the Unlock program in San Francisco being the first one. In Edmonton, they sort of it changed the program a fair bit, but it is based on the notion they're providing care to roughly 600 people in the community who are, uh, who, who are, they don't, to get into PACE, you have to be eligible, meet eligibility requirements for personal care to be in a nursing home. But for choice, they don't have the same kinds of requirements. It's more like frequent hospital admissions, sort of a medically uh, unstable as they refer to it. But of course, big overlap. And they have about 600 participants in five sites, um, patient, people who are living um, in their own homes or in supportive housing who um, come you know, three times a week or five times a week to a day center. And the day center actually has a few sort of intermediate care beds. So if somebody has pneumonia, instead of sending them to the hospital, they actually can just stick up an IV line and watch them for a couple of days in this facility. Um, you know, really you know, amazing stuff. Calgary Comprehensive Community Care is another example. Uh, an ecological view of long-term care. Some of you were familiar with the so-called Eden Alternative um, that, that unfortunately Eden, some of you, if you haven't heard of it, it's the idea is, is to, uh, uh, just as, as we started to approach zoos in new ways 30, 40 years ago, where we realized it's extremely important for the animals to be in as much as possible, or it's not gonna be totally possible, as much as possible, an environment, an ecosystem that seems familiar, right? But on the other hand, we've got human beings, you know, we're animals too, um, and we've got them in facilities, you know, 23 plus hours a day. Many of these people are not gonna leave the walls of the facility you know, except once a month or even less often. And yet we don't plan for what kind of ecosystem do we need for these primates, advanced primates, to, to live well. And we, have, we should be thinking in particular of this because these are, of course, not just regular homo sapiens. These are vulnerable homo sapiens, many of whom have significant cognitive problems. So, and um, I, I've seen lots of good long-term care, and I haven't seen every long-term care facility in this country by any means, but if you're ever in Saskatoon, don't miss going to the Saskatoon Sherpa Community Center. Um, it is the best long-term care facility I've ever seen in this country, um, and you just feel like you're walking into a little piece of heaven when you walk in there. It's amazing. I don't even believe in that. So, um, <laughs> now speaking of, of, of afterlife, and of course we know end of life care, we do terribly, we need to really do this much better. William Roy <coughs> did his research in this and it's had impact in other jurisdictions, now no impact here. Part of the problem is nobody realized that even in the 90s when he was doing his research, the intervention to get people and their families and, and to articulate their actual wishes it cost $120 now, in today's terms, it would probably be 200 We're talking about an intervention that is, you know, at least a couple of hours more of professional time. And we're talking about a serious intervention. We're not just talking about being done on the fly. This is, if you will, you know, Mr. Obama's death panels, right? This is, this is having a conversation about what kind of care you want. But this is really how can you look after pretty much anybody without knowing what kind of care they would like. So, and we also need, you know, we, we need to do a whole better job with acute care for the elderly because it's such, it's so toxic to the elderly. And um, I was um, uh, visiting my family in Winnipeg over the weekend and playing bridge with my parents and an old friend of theirs who had been hospitalized a, a few weeks before. And, and it just doesn't sound like, you know, she needed to be hospitalized. And, 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 and she was kept in, in an emergency room for, for 48 hours. Mm -hmm. I mean, she's so lucky she didn't get delirium or other problems, right? The incident delirium is so high um, in hospitals. Or the idea, why are, you know, we, we have to do everything possible to keep people out of hospital. Um, if we can, if all we need to do is stick up an IV line on somebody, why are we doing that at home? Theoretically, you know, I've talked to CCAC folks over the years, and they'll all say, yeah, theoretically, you know, if we have, like, uh, you know, a, a doctor in someone's home, and if they, somebody's been diagnosed with pneumonia, we can get an IV line in right away. And you know, London had this wonderful program they developed to do that acute care in the home. So but theoretically, they can do this, but it's sort of like, well, of course, if it's any time after about one o'clock, we can't marshal them, and that we're in meetings until 10. 
you know, whatever. So it's not. It's and, and yet this is an emergency. You, you're, you're talking about on average averting, you know, a few thousand dollars in cost. If you know, at, at, at least if you could mobilize people at three in the morning to go stick up the goddamn IV line. I mean, this is not rocket science. And of course, if we want to look at a jurisdiction that actually has done this, and um, and Canada, one could almost give up hopes about because what what is our jurisdiction? We don't seem to be a country. But as many of you will know, in Denmark, with tremendous leadership and um, uh, from a terrific geriatrician there, Dr. Hendrickson, and and all sorts of others, and and the the Scandinavian values about social solidarity. In 1987, um, they put a moratorium on building new, new nursing home beds. They certainly have um, such beds, but they really focused on increasing the construction of social housing, supportive housing, and the services are based there. And they made the key policy um, decision. And, and I would say this is like one of, if we think about sort of the key policies that we've got to look at, this is probably one of the, the most important ones, which is, to ensure that all care is provided according to needs, not location of service. So, so that if you're, you don't, you know, again, you don't, you don't have to live in a nursing home in Denmark to make sure you're covered for all your drugs and appliances, dur you know, uh, durable medical equipment, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You, 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 you don't need um, to be resident nursing. And many of you will know about the German system. It, capacity for self-directed care. So there's lots of ways of thinking about this, but the, this is the key point. Are we going to make um, um, care uh, available according to needs or location? And they made that decision. Plus, they've got the Scandinavian commitment to public responsibility for housing, where in Scandinavia the municipalities are responsible to ensure everyone is housed. That is, that is, that is right there in their laws and it's right there in their values you know for hundreds of years so um, um, and in 1998 they institute a policy of countrywide assessments for all people over 75 it's it's not a hundred percent done but it's done well enough so that basically anybody who you know crises don't happen at the same rate <coughs> because people are known and the system can respond with the community services and the primary health care that is required to keep people as healthy as possible at home. So they've got still an older population than we do, um, and yet spend slightly less as a share of GDP, so um, aging the population doesn't have to be unsustainable at all. And Denmark has far more generous public funding um, for home care drugs, et cetera, et cetera. So in the meantime, okay, quickly, Ontario guts aging at home. This is, this is from a research that Paul Williams and others have done, um, and these are from um, directives um, to the LENS, where 50% of aging at home money in 2009-2010 was directed to ERLC. 2010-2011, 25% of money taxed back to the ministry strategy and 75% now to address these problems. And some of these initiatives, you know, which I've heard about at meetings and stuff, they sound quite laudable. Unfortunately, some of them are lapsing, and so they can't be continued, even the ones that are great. But, you know, as Paul says, aging at home has become, in essence, not aging in hospital. So, and, and, and where is, you know, the, the community-based um, eyes and ears, where is, quite frankly, um, you know, if, if, if we were, if our economy was cut by 70%, and I were somehow foolishly asked to give advice, you know, what can we do now possibly to maintain a modicum of our healthcare system? We could probably have a pretty amazing healthcare system with, if we went back to the district nursing model that was part of what the VON wanted when they were established. And of course, the VON were prevented from doing what they wanted to do by, hands up, the Ontario Medical Association, yeah. who is specifically the biggest. Team. Yeah, and uh, the, the compromise was that they would just go where doctors didn't want to go. Yeah. So um, that, 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 that model, and which unfortunately, in my view, and that's another whole long story, is you know, public health is pulled away from that model. I mean, a district nurse model where nurses know people. I'm not saying the, special, the specialist nurses don't, shouldn't be available. Of course they should. But the basis for our system we could have an unbelievably good health system. Just about the best health system for the elderly I've seen was in Fort Smith, where they have two nurses who are basically doing that. They know all the older people who have health problems. They visit them on a regular basis, flexibly. They know their families. They know everything. And um, they have like 
at, when I visited, just about no hospital utilization. When I pointed this out, the people in the community were very concerned because they've been threatened with a cut to their acute care funding. And so they thought, well, maybe we should cut the home care program if it's keeping people at a hospital. But um, that, that why is it taking so long to go where we need to go? Well, of course, there's, you know, how is policy made? Values are really important. That is how should the world work? We value community-based care, but whose values really count? Um, and Canadians and Ontarians are afraid of not being able to access acute care. That's the big threat. And even though there are periodic, you know, Toronto Star reviews of retirement homes and nursing, etc., you know, that nothing actually gets people as upset, it seems, as the idea that a acute care hospital but that won't be available. And so you know, we need to fix waiting lists to save Medicare. How does the beliefs, how does the world work? Community care and primary health care are frills, it is believed. Um, people do, are not familiar with the research. You know, again, this research from Nancy Hall and Marcus Hollander and authors of others. I've just given you a, a selection of the research. Some of you will know it much deeper than I would. You know, or as what is being said, as uh, I've heard it back at meetings um, from people in government positions, your stuff didn't work, so we put the money into hospitals. Um, interest, how does the world work for me? Well, Ontario is a non-integrated system despite the lens. In the interests of hospitals, physicians, long-term care facilities, and their employees are too often rivals for funding. Um, and the lack of, of, of policies to ensure that the skilled workforce is where it's needed is not there either. So we, we've, got, um, um, we've got this vector where you know, most of the employees within hospitals and nursing homes are unionized, have reasonable wages and benefits, but the community side, of course, is you know, involuntary care, largely female, and, um, and, and often not very well paid other female workers, many of whom, most of whom, are from uh, recent immigrants. So, so this is, this is a, a, a terrible system. We know this. Um, provinces that have better policies to ensure labor is where it is needed, um, like Manitoba, um, have been more successful in moving their system along. And sometimes there's just too many demands. I mean, it, you know, uh, my colleagues at the OMA and people at the Ontario Hospital Association and others are not saying, don't put the money into community-based care, but their voices screaming for money for what they do are just quite overwhelming. And so, like the sow, you know, with a litter of 12 and only two teats, or only 10 teats, you know, two um, of her piglets are not going to be well fed. And the community side, mental, mental health, other services, are where. and of course, there's also been a, quite a bit of money put into primary health care by the new government. I'm not going to get into that particularly, but that is there's a feeling by many in the government that we put a lot of money into the sector it hasn't really paid back. But the way decisions are made, both formally and informally, are a problem. The fact that home care, um, and all continuing care, for example, has been left out of the Medicare Act. Well, there was a little bit on extended care. In the, in the Canada Health Act, but nothing significant. And we're the world's weakest federation. There's only like 20 federations in the world. We're the only federation where the federal government spends um, less than half of um, the public money. We don't have any health goals in this province. There's no official health plan. Um, there's no strategic plan. The Lynn legislation in 2006 requires the ministry to produce a strategic plan. It does not say to whom it's supposed to be delivered or when it's supposed to be delivered. So in the meantime, draft copies of the strategic plan and other things circulate in the ether, and some people know about them and some people don't, and that's convenient often. Um, many provincial policy directions are only um, OHC draft form, not officially available. There's few service frameworks. That's something that's really missing, that the National Health Service, which has been, you know, it seems an inspiration in many ways to lots of people in, in Ontario, um, that the service frameworks are really useful in the UK, really showing how services are supposed to be delivered um, um, right from prevention, right through to palliative care. Um, the ministry priorities are given to Linz are mainly about acute care, and there's little social policy coordination. Really, if you think about it, Denmark gets to do a lot of things because people just have a strong sense of solidarity, and, and you don't even need to have health impact assessments and stuff like that in Denmark and most many other countries because it's just there. But in Ontario, we are living in North America. We are, and, and we have a very much, a more American style view that we take policies as they come 
and, and you know, even looking at what the senior secretary and other groups have been able to do or at the federal level initiatives to coordinate. It just doesn't work because you often get lower level officials working on this stuff. Even when you get some senior people involved, you know, by the time it gets to the cabinet office, it's sort of like, well, I know you're, well, you meant this well, but we're not going to do this coordination that you're talking about. So it's anathema to Canadian governments to really do this properly. The exception you see, the big exception is Quebec, right? And you see it done a little bit better in places like Saskatchewan and, and Manitoba occasionally under NDP governments, but most of the time governments are not that interested in coordinating social policy. The LINs appear to have little real authority to integrate services. Um, I'm saying this, um, that, that, that even though technically they do, you know, where's the PACE programs, you know? Um, Eunice McGowan, I haven't seen her in years, but I know Eunice had to retire years ago without the dream of a PACE program that she'd had since 1980. You know, um, you know, we just can't do this stuff. Even Alberta did some of the stuff. And of course, you know, and, you know, it, it, these people make a lot more than I make, um, but um, Lynn CEOs make significantly less than hospital vice presidents, and we all know that's a real indication of your power. All the best to Camille for doing good work in Toronto, but and we continue to plan in silence. And the LINs fund but do not run these organizations. The ministry's contract with the LINs, the LINs contract with CCACs, CCACs contract with home care agencies. I mean, you need you need four contracts before anybody gets a bath. Um, you know, Ontario bizarrely believes in the purchaser provider split. In Ontario, people will nod their heads and say, yeah, we do it this way and we're proud. In other provinces, they love this because it proves that Ontario is stupider than other provinces. <laughs> you know, it's just, it, it just doesn't make sense, you know? Like, like in, when you're getting home care in Calgary, it's almost always somebody with a uniform that says Alberta Health Services on it, you know? Um, and, and again, I, that's another whole thing to discuss, discuss but managed competition is really a strange thing. The LINs have few professional staff. Physicians and drugs are funded by the province. The primary health care policy is largely set in negotiations with the OMA, the family health teams, good, bad, and ugly. The, it's good that it's revitalized the lives of many nearly retired family doctors. Many people I've known for years who weren't making a killing as family doctors are now making $300,000 a year. Um, you know, and, uh, but um, the bad is that they are thriving with less needy patients in less needy areas. And we know that there's been substantial increases in pay. And the program is being sold on work 30% less, make 30% more. Um, and the ugly is that the funding formula, the capitation funding formula, is based on provincial averages. And yet we know these are healthier than average patients. Um, we are misallocating <coughs> hundreds of millions of dollars right now. How are we going to get the money back to go where it should go? Um, you know, that in, in wealth, um, the, uh, the, the family health team is recruiting patients in the shopping mall, but they won't take referrals from social service agencies because they're too needy. So they're working out a way in which the community health center as well can take on these patients because they're the only place that takes them on um, and then buff them up and make them healthier and make them behave better. And then a year later, they'll graduate to the family health team when they won't cost any money anymore. It's ugly. No one knows about this. Information, the truth doesn't set us free. You know, we think of it as frill, as community care as frills. We think of community health centers as a nice model, but they are, their per patient costs are, are higher. Well, of course, they've got sicker patients, and we're not counting the hospital care, which is where you get the um, trade-off from good primary health care. I mean, I can't believe in the government, this, everybody believes this. I actually had a grad student trace this once, and we traced it down to one ministry official, traced it all the way back to her, said, why? Are you saying this? What is your evidence to support this? Did not have any evidence to support it, but everybody knows this. It appears much that much of health policy in Ontario elsewhere is driven by inertia, values, and interests, and faulty informed decision-making processes. But that's the way policy mainly goes. So, how do we hasten a community-based system? Real quickly, in three minutes or less, how do we actually get more information and knowledge into the policy process? It's not going to be through traditional knowledge exchange and transmission um, routes, I believe. We need to have a theory of the policy process. I don't think that most KE and KT really does have one. Um, and there needs to be a theory about the use of information on the policy process. And I guess most KE and KT doesn't have that. So 
Um, and pick a framework, any framework. I think that, that, that unfortunately we have not moved much in the last 10 years on this. Knowledge exchange isn't a relay, and policy development isn't linear. So what's the role for information? It's always incomplete, too often used after the fact to bolster one's own points or knock down those of others, rarely used primarily. And Paul Sabatier, some of you will make, you know, one of the authors of the Advocacy Coalition Framework, refers to policy-oriented learning um, as ways in which you can get systems to accept new information. Essentially, he talks about like the old days under Larry Grossman, when he facilitated those forums where the OMA and other groups had to come around. Remember, some of us, some of us veterans remember those. <laughs> they had to come and actually say in public what they would say in private, and they found that they were just completely mashed into the ground when they said these things in private because they weren't effective in public. They were embarrassing um, to them. They had to regroup. So we don't, you know, for 27, 28 years, we really haven't had effective policy discourse in Ontario. Um, you need one to ensure that information is properly used. What's the point of having meetings on primary health care when the OMA doesn't come, when we set primary health care policy in the province has been negotiated in between the OMA and the provincial government? Why have a meeting that doesn't deal with that issue? It's not going to do anything. So conditions for policy are the learning. You need at least two coalitions. Um, there's a strong coalition in this province for more community-based care for the elderly. There's been no effective forums for it to appear at, right? We all go to forums. Members in this room go to forums. What's the point? You know, it's like we're, we're, we, show, you know, we showed up you know, in Winnipeg in February 2010 all ready for the Olympics, but they weren't there. They're in Whistler, you know, so we're showing up at the wrong arenas for our policy debates, and we are surprised when, you know, our words have no impact. Um, there needs to be a forum amenable debate. There needs to be an audience. You need to be able to move the yardsticks. In other words, you need to ensure that when the OMA says something and it's stupid and everybody says it's stupid, they can't just use it again, right? But they can always use it again under the current system. So Canadian governments need to craft new ways of developing health policy. Sunshine is the best disinfectant. We need to have open policy debates. We need to challenge um, provider groups that are recalcitrant to change. And we need to challenge government to open up the, these, this policy process. Um, in summary, the recession has magnified Ontario government's fiscal problems. Medicare is sustainable as we want it to be. The elderly won't undermine Medicare sustainability if we change our delivery system. And um, it's taking forever to get to where we want to go for very understandable reasons. The status quo exists for really good reasons, and if you don't know why the status quo exists, then your prescriptions for change are unlikely to be effective. And we need to change the way we debate policy. And finally, this is another way of sort of thinking about the issues that we're in right now, that we've got um, this like 18th century style or even earlier style of professional practice. Most specialists, you know, 50 minute appointments, I'm the great man on a throne, crawl to me, I'll give you my received advice and then you go away and everything will be fine. Um, this bizarre professional practice from centuries ago, we've got 19th century Bismarckian insurance, and then we're surprised that we don't have a high performing 21st century healthcare system. Mm -hmm. So let's get smarter. I've given up the notion that we're going to be able to get that new system for my parents in time for them, but I sure hope the heck that it will be in time for me. Thank you very much for inviting me here. It looks like we've got another question. Thank you. So, and I've, I've, got, I've, got, I've, got, I've got two copies of this booklet that Hugh McKenzie and I wrote. I think I should just have to leave them here, but you can find it full text online at the Canadian Federation of Nurses Union's website and, and, and at my website, which I, uh, we'll just we'll get back to that. First slide. Yeah, sorry, a million slides. And of course, the, the slide deck is, is available from the folks at the Institute, and I'm happy to send it to people if you want to email me as well. And this is, this is the book letter for sustainability in Medicare that Hugh McKenzie and I wrote. He is the first author for good reasons. The crunching is, 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 is mainly his book for the crunching. Okay. Do, do you want to answer a couple questions? or? Do you yeah, no, no, no. And yeah. I'm sorry that we've only got 12, 13 minutes to do it. Yeah, okay, there we go. So, Michael, when we're talking about community health and um, getting senior services at home, we're talking essentially about prevention, preventing seniors from having to go to hospital and so on. 
One of the biggest problems with aging at home and the implementation of it for the government was how do you measure a non-event? So if you give, if you put money into helping seniors stay healthy and at home, how do you count that? How can you demonstrate to the government that your money has done something? Whereas if you have a senior in a bed, in a hospital, or in a merge, and you put money into it and you pull them out, then you can say, aha, you see, we gave you money to the hospital and look what they've done with it, or to the lid, or to whoever it is. So the problem for me has always been that it's very difficult to measure uh, the effect of something when it is a preventative, a health promotion kind of service. No, you're right, but, but on the other hand, just as, um, you know, it, if, if you, if you I've, I've visited, I know, two dozen emergency rooms across Canada, and there are differences in, you know, communities, at least qualitatively, the emergency staff will tell me, on how many seniors in crisis do you get, right? Um, and that, 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 again, that's not, everybody knows that, that, that type of person. Your indicators may not be right on at this point, but you can probably, even with current data, get a handle on that issue, and if you start measuring it more, it's more, and, and the other thing, I, 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 I do, under, I'm, I'm sympathetic to what you're saying, but you know, another way to look at it is that if you've got someone who is hospitalized, and then um, any, again, I would make the case, anybody who's over 65 who's got anything that's mildly chronic, there should be a nurse coordinating their care going home. They should know what the home looks like before they go home, and then they should continue to provide the care that's necessary to that person when they go home. Now, even if you just did that, in a systemic basis, as opposed to what is currently being done, because that's not the current way that patients are being discharged, then you would make a big difference in the number of people coming back the next week. You know, in Sault Ste. Marie, it's not that common for people with congestive heart failure to end up in the emergency room. But I think what we have here is what you refer to as rivals for funding. Yes. So if you ask a hospital to keep track of the statistics, who came into your hospital emerge? Uh, of a certain age, etc., and try to uh, produce the data by a hospital to reinforce that community agencies in the area have done a great job. That's so you just you just highlighted you can't do this without integrated funding, and that's why the lens were created to begin with. And 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 how come we don't have like hospitals that are dramatically smaller and all sorts of programs for all inclusive care for the elderly? And why don't we have a whole bunch more nurses working in the community? Um, you know, that's because of the fact that we've got a, a still a system where we have only linked some services financially and we have not overcome the barriers to integrating those services enough. Okay. Um, just picking up on that, I was looking at the statistic where there's higher use of uh, GPs in the older population. And I think uh, what we uh, don't attend to is the fact that if you take a look at uh, general practice, what are the uh, primary issues you're dealing with? It's hypertension, diabetes, and obesity, or overweight. If you track those people, regardless of age, uh, what happens to them in the community, okay? The GP simply says, here's what you need to do. We know 50% do not follow their rehab regime. Simply don't. Well, we've got, we, you know, we've got almost no, we, almost no systematic self-management training that's going on. We, 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 the ministry, of course, has been using the so-called chronic care model that many of you are familiar with that was refined in BC from a, something Ed Wagner and colleagues in Seattle developed. It's a great model for thinking about services, but, but you know, people see this model and they think, oh, we're doing this, we're not. We're not even close to managing chronic disease the way we should be. Most of these people should be seeing their doctors probably as 12th as frequently as they are. You know, instead of seeing them every month, they should see them at most once a year. Most of their follow-up, they should be doing themselves with the assistance of a nurse. They should be getting, we should be paying for self-management training, the Stanford kinds of training. We should be, like, we're talking, we're talk, you know, diabetes day on Tuesday and, and Thursdays between eight and 10 in this practice. Um, you just drop in and you see a nurse, you drop off your urines, you do this, you do that, and, and if you don't want to see the doctor, you don't need to see the doctor. I mean, um, so, so that, that we, we just budge like 1% in, 
it towards the service redesign that we should have been. So, so, so it's, it's, it, and, and yet people again think we're doing it. Oh yeah, we got this yeah. framework now and we have this, we're doing it, we're not. Sorry, I cut you off a little bit, but I'm just Well, I'm just thinking, I think if you look within the LIN system, I think the popular, the uh, service uh, providers we should be looking at are the GPs and looking at their practices and what are they not able to provide and how might we reduce GP visits by providing these extended community services, whether it's a uh, visiting nurse or whatever. But I think if you think of prevention uh, and repeated use of services, I think we're, you know, we're needing a model that uh, people can access services within their home and be followed over time and it's going to cost the system much less than repeated hospitalizations in their room and so on. Yep, okay. Over here. This is a real pie in the sky. But, um, where I live with the community center just got funding for uh, new horizons and watching the number of seniors that come and they have programs five days a week watching the change in those people one particular person was a locked in person and she's there every day. So if you can go back, you're not looking after sick people, you're promoting health, and we don't do that. No, you're absolutely right. And, and, and again, that when you think about health promotion and trying to prove it and everything, you know, it, it's, 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 much, it's much harder to prove that health promotion with a 40-year-old will be difficult, but actually, you're going to be surprised if you say, it is, it is like simple to prove that it's effective for an 80-year-old who's just leaving the hospital. And the reason is that because their absolute event rates are so high, both of getting ill hospital readmissions, they're so high, there's tons of research that indicates that if you provide intensive health promotion, pay attention to people's diets and exercise with older people, particularly identified as just coming out of illness, your payback is massive and it's really quick. It's really quick. I can't emphasize that enough. Because, because you've got, you know, without some intervention, you're talking about thousands and thousands of dollars a year on average of healthcare expenditures. And with younger people, you don't have those to offset. And we have tons of research with patients with congestive heart failure, chronic obstructive lung disease, and other conditions that better, and plus you're often talking about people who actually don't have as many choices. I mean, we're gonna pick you up and we're gonna take you to a day center three times a week. You're gonna do this circuit around the center of you know, 100 feet, and it's going to take you maybe like three minutes to do the first time, and we're going to time you. This is what they do at OnLock in San Francisco. It's all, you know, um, um, uh, you know, repetitions. It's all interval training. It's the kind of stuff that those of us, you know, who used to run marathons would get into, but they're designed for older people. And, and so that, you know, and by the time you can do that 100 feet in 45 seconds instead of three minutes, your chances of falling and breaking your leg are way less, way less. So I really want to, you know, make that point in particular, that, that health promotion, that if we start off our health promotion actually with that group, where the payback is going to be immense. Yeah, I'll tell a story from Ottawa that very much reinforces what you're saying. There's a program called Aging in Place, what they did was to select some with postal codes, they selected buildings with a lot of seniors who were ending up in, in emergency a lot. They put a nurse in those places, and then they watched the, the uh, mm -hmm. ER admissions go way down. It was very quick. They did it first in about six buildings. Uh, they're now trying to expand it using non-event measures, right? And so it can be done. Uh, my, my point previously was that you're asking the hospital to collect the data that doesn't support their ER ALC dollars, but supports the community's dollars. That's hard to get. Yeah, well, the, the hospital's ERs are in part uh, inhabited by people, and especially the families of people who want the elderly in long-term care, and that and that's the route. If you wait uh, in the community, you wait a couple of years, you go through the hospital, you get on ALC, and it's 45 days or something. So it, it's a, there's a very strong, perverse incentive. Uh, go to the emergency room. <laughs> okay, do we have time maybe for one last question over here? And maybe one over here. Wouldn't it be wise if people who were slotted into ALC beds were treated differently? In other words, they're not slotted into beds to go into LTCs, but they're slotted for recreation, activation, rehabilitation, and going back into the community. 
but we look at, the, my mother was 97 and had a congestive heart failure. She was looking at a small group home for 10 ladies and it was doing very well. She ended up with congestive heart failure, spent three days in the hospital, she's fine. They wouldn't let her go back to where she was living. She spent 11 weeks in an ALC bed, six weeks in a nursing home, and she died. But those 11 weeks, I used to say, you've got a room down at the end of the hall here that's full of equipment, why don't you use it for congregate dining and activation recreation? Why don't you have something going point. where people can go back to the community? Because otherwise, <laughs> if, if somebody like your mother is put in a bed for a few days, they yeah. might not be able to really yeah. get up. Yeah. Us, yeah. So. Yeah. And then we have the last question here. I just want to get that. It seems to me that there's some great resistance on the part of the OMA and the province um, to use any methods of health promotion and prevention. I know when I was with public health, I had a staff of 30 nurses who dealt only with the seniors in, in North York. I thought when I retired, a year after, there were not dealing with seniors. So it occurs to me, what, where's the resistance coming from? I mean, doctors obviously are not interested in doing much in the way of health prevention or promotion. And it sounds to me, or it seems to me, that the government is not either. So how, well, do, we, how do we attack that one? No, I, 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 I very much agree with, with the sentiments of what you're saying. I think, I think the way to attack it is that um, you know, we have to remind the government and the Ontario Medical Association that the medical care in this province belongs to us, the people of the province. It does not belong to the OMA. It is not something that um, government and the OMA can get together behind closed doors and work out what's easier for them every few yeah. years. It's, 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 to, it's to provide us with good care. And that means that physicians need to be integrated with other professionals, but that we need to ensure that everybody with a serious chronic disease has proper self-management training, that, that all of that health promotion is integrated into the follow-up in their primary health care. It isn't something that is completely separate. Um, we're talking about a completely different style of medical practice. And I, so I think that, that, that the, the secret for some of this stuff is that, and I, you know, given that the government and the OMA are talking again and the agreement is up in October, we need to, you know, all be that, you know, a number of you are involved with organizations, let's start having some forums on the agreement, shine a bright light on it, and push the government, which I think eventually would be very happy, hopefully, to have this outside pressure, because government is codependent with the OMA in this, because if they step out of line, they will be uh, beaten severely. So um, that we have to break that door open for the people of the province, I think all of us in the organization we're part of, and to start talking about the agreement and its public policy, it's not just your policy. So with that, thank you. Thank you. Well, it didn't the everybody here needs to move to Manitoba, huh? So you're going to get good care. Because we know this is tiny. Gerontologists are poor. But thank you. That was fabulous. <laughs> Thanks for inviting me.